Well, welcome to Black Gumbo Southern Gardening. It's time for another episode of Questions and Answer. Let's get started. So today's question and answer video was cobbled together over the course of several days and so you're going to get different kind of sound levels, different mics, it's raining so I've had to dodge the rain. So just a warning up front, it's not going to be all that technically good, but thank you for bearing with us. Okay, so we got a question from Trudy so Saura and uh, Trudy says, my biggest problem so far is saving seeds from seed packets and she only uses a few seeds, four seeds to get two big tomato plants, so there's a lot left over. And Trudy wants to know what's the best way to save them for next year. Um, well, here's a good method that I found. Uh, several gardeners have recommended this. This is a photograph uh, case. It's designed to be a plastic case uh, that has these little smaller cases in it so that you can organize your seeds and keep them nice and dry. And so you get all those little things in there, those little packets of seeds stored in these uh, little boxes. And this is how I've been storing seeds for a long time. And you know, I've got them organized according to, you know, cowpeas, lima beans, various other seeds. And you, you can get a lot of, uh, you get a lot of seeds in this thing. Of course, I've got more seeds than this. But the key, once you've got your, your organization down, is to store your seeds in a cool, dry, preferably a dark place. So, I have a closet under my stairway, and there's a shelf up there. That's where I, I store all my seeds. Cool, because it's in the house. Dry, because air conditioning takes the humidity out of the air. And dark, because this is a closet. And you can see I've got a bag full of seeds here. We've got some other stuff in here that needs to be in the dark. Incidentally, this is where we store our tinctures and extractions. And it's also the closet in which I store ferments. Well, our second question comes from Marcella and Dingle and others, and they want to know, what's my new camera that I've got here that I'm recording? Well, I'm going to have to revert to my old camera, which was my iPhone. I was using an iPhone 7S, and I've been using that for the past two or three years, and it's worked well for me, uh, but I thought it was time to upgrade. So let me show you what I'm using now. I am using this Lumix DC G100. It's made by Panasonic and it's supposed to have a pretty revolutionary sound system. So far I like the microphone, but right now because it's windy I'm using my, uh, my, uh, my lavalier mic and I've just kind of strapped that to the tripod because it's not designed for this. But I like it and so far so good. I'm trying to learn how to use the focus system and the uh, autofocus, it's a little jittery. I gotta tame it down some, but so far so good. It's very crisp and clear. And I have this just on a cheap Amazon tripod and so far so good. So there it is, a Lumix. And this camera has the ability to track my face, has facial recognition. Uh, it's supposed to be for vlogging. It's a very uh, popular camera for people who are holding the camera and on the go. It's got good image stabilization. It does have uh, optical zoom and that comes in handy rather than a digital zoom. Um, it's fully manual. It takes great photographs and it's got a lot of options. I'm still learning it, but there it is. Our third question comes from Simply Paradise Life and uh, they want to know how long does my summer garden last? Now this is what I consider my spring garden and spring for me goes from March the 1st which is my average last frost date all the way into middle of June, July if anything lasts that long. Once the heat starts getting above 90 degrees these tomato plants they're not going to pollinate and there's no more reason to keep them around and nurse them through the summer when I can pull them out and plant heat loving crops like Malabar spinach, okra, eggplant, peppers, uh, sweet potatoes, cowpeas and things like that. And So that's what I do through the summer. During the summer I used to take a break because it's just too hot to get out here and 
and work in the garden, but you got to make advantage, uh, take advantage of the seasons. And here I can put in a summer garden and grow those heat loving crops and have a harvest. About October is when I plan to start my fall slash winter garden, which will carry me back to the spring. That's actually my favorite time of planting. In zone 9A here on the Texas coast, usually you can grow a winter garden through the entire winter. And even if we have a freeze or two, if it's not a hard freeze like we had this past year, your plants are going to make it through just fine. In fact, it's the best time for growing brassicas like broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower. And it's a beautiful time in the garden. It's actually my favorite. So yeah, the spring garden, its days are numbered. Once the harvests are in, most of this stuff is coming out. Question number four comes from the Apopka Gardener. And the Apopka Gardener wants to know, why do my tomatoes look so good? Uh, do I use fertilizer in my garden for these tomatoes? Um, yeah, I'll tell you about my fertilizing. I do fertilize these. Uh, all these tomatoes, I use this Neptune's Garden 242 uh, tomato and vegetable formula. Very good stuff. It's based on a fish emulsion. It's uh, water soluble and I do this every two weeks. And that has kept these tomatoes healthy and green. Um, I also used fish emulsion on my herbs and all the other garden uh, plants. Uh, periodically, maybe every four weeks if they need it. But uh, most of my fertilizing and nutrition in the soil comes from compost. And I'll lay a, a, a half inch layer of my own compost that I make in my compost bin over the entire surface of all three of my garden beds. And that compost adds organic matter to the soil and as the bacteria work to break down that compost, they release nutrients into your soil. And it just is a, it's just a really good soil. And so I've grown in my gardens in uh, past years without any fertilization at all, just relying on my compost. But this year I'm trying to see just how big a harvest I can get with this uh, single vine pruning method on these cherry tomatoes to see how big I can get them. And I'm looking here and need to prune. But uh, yeah, these have been outstanding. And I'm just so impressed with this variety. It's Edox, it's a F1 hybrid. Get it at Johnny Seeds. And I've been harvesting uh, for the past week or two now. And as they ripen up, um, yeah, they, they're, they're just a wonderful tomato. So I do fertilize every two weeks with Neptune's Harvest. And yeah, it's not cheap, but it goes a long way. So these tomatoes, uh, I've been harvesting. There's some that are probably ready to come on in. But uh, this soil down here is mulched with my typical mulch here. But it's very organic filled soil. It's good stuff. It's deep black rich. It's loose. It holds together. It holds moisture. And uh, yeah, I worked hard to make this soil. And all I do every year is put a layer of compost. If you raked it out smoothly, it'd be about a half an inch in every garden bed in between my growing seasons. Uh, usually once a year, sometimes twice a year. And that's how I get all these lush plants, along with the fertilizing. But look at that, man. Isn't that great? That's crazy. We got a lot of rain. And some of those little cherry tomatoes, a couple of them began to crack because, wow, they took up a lot of water. And tomorrow we're expecting even more rain. So I'm not sure how these tomatoes are going to respond, but we'll see. You can complain about the rain or you can count it as free water for your garden in the best kind. Okay, so our fifth question comes from the one broad two. And uh, the question is, do you top prune once early in the season or later if the top keeps growing? And this is a question in my pruning peppers or topping peppers uh, video. And that question has to do with these young pepper plants like this guy. And the idea with pruning peppers is kind of, um, it's kind of controversial because some people say you should, some people say you shouldn't. The purpose of topping a young pepper plant, and one much younger than this, is to force out branching growth and keep a bushier plant. And in theory, some of these uh, chili peppers, like these smaller ones, like these jalapenos, you'll get more peppers on the plant because there's more branching. And uh, with more branches, you have more opportunity for, fruit, uh, you know, for fruits to develop. So um, some people say, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, pepper plants are like a determinant. They're going to put out a certain amount of fruit and that's it and they're done. Well, I've seen the argument go both ways and I've experienced both. With larger peppers, when you top them to force branching, you're going to usually get smaller fruits. 
with smaller peppers like jalapenos and cayenne peppers, uh, you'll often get um, you'll often get more fruits, and they'll you won't really notice the size difference. So when you top a plant, you want to wait till it has four to six true leaves like these, not the seed leaves, and you want to just lop everything off above that, and that will force branching in all of these little nodes here, uh, all of these crooks where the suckers come up. Uh, there's one right there. I don't know if you can see it. That guy right there would branch out into its own branch. But uh, these, this year, most of mine have bushed out fine on their own. And so it's just a matter whether you want a shorter, bushier plant or you want to just let them grow naturally. The question is though, do you do it just once? Yes, you usually just top a pepper once and that's it. You just let it bush out naturally and, and let it grow. Future pruning, if you're treating your peppers like perennials and bringing them into uh, the next growing season, you'll want to clean them up and prune them, but that's a different, that's true pruning. That's not topping a pepper. Topping a pepper takes the growth hormone called auxin and it's always at the tip. It's at the, the highest point of the plant because the plant wants to grow up toward the sun. It, it takes those auxins and, and you lop off that, that dominance, that apical dominance, and it redirects the growth hormone. That's what pushes out side growth. So you can top your peppers if you want. Do it once. Um, try a side-by-side -side comparison with two of the same kinds of plants and see how it works for you. Our next question comes from Anthony. Anthony says he's a new gardener and has a beginner question. He asks, do you recommend pruning tomato plants? Um, he knows that it can be a pretty in-depth topic. Um, yeah, that is a beginner question, but there's no dumb questions, and thank you for answer, uh, asking that question. Um, I always prune tomato plants if they're indeterminate varieties. All those plants back there have been carefully pruned and trained and taken up one single vine. If you don't prune an indeterminate tomato plant, uh, it's likely to bush out, sprawl, flop over on the ground and congest itself. Even if you try to support it, like in a cage, it's gonna to get too dense in there, too much foliage, and it's gonna shade out the, the, the leaves below. They're gonna turn yellow and drop off. And um, well, it's just not healthy. Uh, I like to prune my plants to a single vine now. That's my newest method that I enjoy the best. But in the past, I've pruned my plants to two or three main vines and put them in a trellis of some sort. But that always helps. I've got a video on pruning tomatoes up a single vine. And there are lots of videos out there on pruning tomato plants. And all you got to do is just Google that and, or uh, enter pruning tomato plants in YouTube and you'll find a wealth of information. But I want to show you the difference between a pruned tomato plant and one that's just been left to grow. Okay, notice this guy here. This tomato plant has been pruned to be one single vine all the way up to the top. And what you do to get this one single vine is every time you see a sucker, like this guy right here in the, in the crotch of the main vine and a leafing branch, you want to pinch it out. So here's the main vine. This is a leafing branch. All that's going to ever produce is leaves. And this is a sucker, which can produce an entire new main vine. Pinch it out. And that's all you do to keep your your tomato plants pruned. If you get a sucker that you forget about, like this one right here, here's a leafy branch right here. This is the main vine and this is a sucker. You can see how it grows into a whole nother vine and there's fruiting uh, fruit flowers right on there. If you wanted two main vines, you just let that go. But I'm gonna have to come in and snap that out because I want this to be uh, one vine. Let me show you what it looks like when you let them go naturally. Here is a tomato plant that I believe is a Juliet, and it's a volunteer, it came up on its own. And so you can see it came up right here. Here's the main vine. There's a sucker, it's gonna grow up into another main vine. Um, here's another sucker that has grown into a main vine with fruiting flowers on it. Here's the other vine, and all along here it's gonna branch out and form this unruly mess of a, a tomato plant. It's gonna be hard to keep staked up if you put it in a cage, you're going to condense all this into a big dense mass and you're going to have trouble with the, you know, the upper leaves shading out your lower leaves. So I always like to prune them. This is just a, a, a volunteer that I didn't plan on, so I just let it come up and let it sprawl so I could show you the difference there. These tomato plants, however, are not indeterminate varieties that vine out. These are determinants and they're called bush varieties and they just grow like a bush and you don't trim them at all. You might come in and trim out some of the density of the leafy branches, but you don't prune off any of the suckers or the growing 
uh, the, the main vines. And you can see what happens when you let it get a little too dense. Down here in the middle of the plant, if I can get it to focus, down there in the middle of the plant you get yellowing leaves because they're not getting sun. And so you'll want to come in there and just trim those branches off. But everything above that is just fine. A determinant plant like this puts on a set amount of fruit and then it's finished. All right, so our next question comes from Suze. She says, do I add mulch over my top layer of compost? If so, what do you use? So yes, all these gardens get that top layer of compost between growing seasons. Whenever I clear out a bed, I rake off my existing mulch and save it. And I put a layer of compost over the whole bed. As for mulch, the mulches I like, I prefer shredded hardwood mulch, the kind you get in a bag. Non-dyed, non um, no, no dyes in it at all, just plain shredded hardwood. Not pine, but hardwood. And that lasts me for two or three years. And if, if you can rake it up and keep it under a tarp somewhere. And it breaks down and adds nutrition to the soil, but never mix it in, of course. But I, that's what I prefer. But that's not what I can always afford. In fact, I haven't had hardwood mulch in a while. Um, I did have hardwood mulch on my far bed for several years recently, but now it's all gone. But uh, what I do use is a free resource. I use grass clippings and oak leaves. Every year in the spring, my oak tree sheds all its leaves and I go out there and mow them up and put them in a bin. And the grass clippings that I cut from my lawn, throw those in a bin and let them dry out. Once those oak leaves and grass uh, clippings are mixed together, that makes a perfect mulch. Let me show it to you. That's what it looks like. It's just grass clippings mixed with oak leaves. And you can see how if you put too much on there, water can't penetrate very well because the bottom portion is dry. So I just use uh, more leaves than grass. But yeah, grass, grass clippings make a great addition to your garden as mulch. And the grass breaks down faster than the oak leaves. So at the end of the season, um, I have more oak leaves to use. I rake them up and put them back in this bin. And yeah, it's a great free resource. If you can find free mulch, that's always good. Look at this mess back here. We've had so much rain. Pulled water. Yeah, it's mushy. It's mushy out here. If you don't use mulch, you run the risk of your soil drying out too quickly and uh, your plants getting water, you know, getting thirsty for water. But sometimes it's okay. I've got peppers and uh, eggplant in this unmulched portion of the beds. And I do plan on mulching it in the heat of the summer, but right now, um, it doesn't really affect the uh, the growth of these plants very very much. Um, and it does allow me to get in there and get the weeds out with the stirrup hoe, uh, which this soil has a lot of weeds in it uh, this season, so that's what I'm having to do. Our next question comes from Tucker Family Homestead. Um, she says, everything looks so awesome. Uh, we love eggplant, but we're battling flea beetles really bad this year. Any recommendations? Yeah. Um, Sometimes we organic gardeners um, get infestations. This year I had cucumber beetles. Right now I'm battling uh, army worms and my tomatoes. And sometimes you just can't pick them by hand and get them under control. There are a lot of options for us as organic gardeners. And some of you will like them. Some of you will probably avoid them. But with any kind of chewing or eating pest, I'd try first neem oil. Get you some cold pressed neem oil. It doesn't even have to be made for the garden. Uh, neem oil is uh, one of those that um, chewing insects and piercing insects will take in and it will it will kill them or stop them from eating. Neem oil is kind of the safest first line of defense. Um, I've got a video that shows you how to use neem oil on your plants and I'll link it up there. If you have caterpillars, this BT thuricide is a good product and the active in ingredient in this is Bacillus thuringiensis. I think that's how it's said. Um, it's a bacterial uh, compound that actually, it's actually a living bacteria. When you spray this on your plants, caterpillars ingest it and they uh, stop feeding. It works on caterpillars and various other kinds of insects, but Bt is a safe organic uh, solution to use. Uh, but if you've got actual beetles and things like that, I, I recommend uh, this uh, spinosad based product. Spinosad is an organic insecticide. It kills bagworms, borers, and beetles. And this uh, Bonide brand, Captain Jack's Dead Bug, I've used this in the past and found it to be pretty effective. Always read the back. It'll tell you what kinds of 
insects that this kind of product controls, but it is an organic insecticide. The, uh, the big guns, Pyganic, this is a pyrethrin based organic uh, insecticide. Pyrethrin is derived from the chrysanthemum, so it is a, a naturally sourced uh, chemical and it is organic, it's certified organic. However, be careful with pyrethrin. Pyrethrin kills pretty much everything, including bees, and uh, you don't wanna, you don't wanna spray that on your plants when your, your flowers are, when your plants are in bloom, because you're attracting pollinators, and if they get into the pyrethrin, it'll kill them. However, I found that pyrethrin did knock back my cucumber beetles very significantly. I was coming out into my squash and seeing uh, you know dozens of them in a day, and after I sprayed the pyrethrin-based insecticide on my squash plants and on my cucumbers, uh, I didn't see but maybe one or two a week. And so it really knocked their numbers back, and that's helpful. Um, but again, you have to make the decision that, it, that you're, a, you're willing to take responsibility for using insecticides because insecticides can sometimes knock out your good insects as well. The ideal situation is to, have a, it's to encourage a balance of good and good insects in your garden so that they will prey on the bad insects. But sometimes things get out of balance. Sometimes you just can't, you know, you can't manage it and you got to resort to these products. Another thing about these products is read the labels. They will tell you if you can harvest your food, you know, right away or if you need to wait a few days. This pyrethrin, for example, um, it, it goes away pretty quickly because the sun breaks it down. And so, you know, it's pretty safe. You can, you can eat your food that's been sprayed with pyrethrins uh, pretty soon. There's a list online, there's a list on the, on the label on the back and it tells you the recommended wait time. And obviously you wanna wash your food before you eat it. So yeah, sometimes you gotta break out the chemicals, even the organic chemicals, um, they, they can be very effective. Um, right now I have army worms in my tomatoes and so I've been spraying the army worms, worms with this BT, but then now it's raining and so it just washes everything right off. So I've got to go out and every, you know, every time there's going to be an extended portion of the day where there's no rain, I'll spray those, those worms down and try to hand pick as many as I can. But they're called army worms for a reason. They show up in so many, you know, there's, there's dozens and dozens of them and it's hard to hand pick them. They hide so well, but um, yeah, insecticides. I don't like using them, but sometimes you have to. Well, there we have it. Question and answer episode 18 in the bag. I've had to work hard to get this Q&A done because I've been dodging rain showers, having to work over the course of a couple of days to answer your questions. And uh, I'm working with a new camera and I can't, uh, I, you know, I'm still trying to work out the kinks of my new camera. And so the audio in this video, uh, you may have noticed is, uh, you know, off and on, uh, different kinds of quality because I'm using different mic combinations. And so, well, I could just get to let you guys uh, be the guinea pig. So anyway, if you've liked this video, thank you so much. Please share it and follow us on Instagram and please do subscribe to our channel. We'll talk to you next time. Happy gardening. Bye-bye.